The, <laughs> today I want to demo some technology that we've put together and talk about a, uh, some things that we've been working on to look at ways that organizations can reduce the time that they had, they're exposed to vulnerabilities. Um, if you've uh, kept track of the data from like the, the Whitehead folks, the Maricode folks that are releasing data about like the lifespan of vulnerabilities, you see that a lot of organizations, um, they, they do a great job of finding vulnerabilities. Um, they often don't do as uh, the workman like a job of fixing vulnerabilities. And when you, uh, when you combine that with the fact that in a lot of organizations, um, at least some of the uh, you know, some of the infrastructure that they have, or, or even a lot of the infrastructure that they have, there aren't necessarily strong controls about what code gets put out there. Um, puts you in a situation where organizations can end up with a tremendous amount of exposure from their web-based systems that they don't necessarily know about. And so, um, what we're going to look at are some techniques that we've been playing around with to try and uh, you know, to try and automate um, the you know, at, at least the uh, you know, short-term functional remediation of these types of vulnerabilities. Um, again, I'm, I'm Dave Brown, the founder and CTO of Denner Group, and, uh, and, and my background is as a software developer who's focused on security. And uh, so, uh, you know, again, did a lot of work in uh, server-side Java, um, and then spent a couple years doing .NET stuff. Uh, in the last, uh, you know, however many years, uh, seven years or so, been focused on security. And so that's, that's my perspective. Um, and, and, and I'll freely admit, I don't come from a really strong like security operations background. And so that's one of the things that we're pushing to do um, with this technology that we've developed is to start to get feedback from folks that maybe attended these techniques, um, who are interested in you know, rolling out or beta testing these types of techniques. So uh, please feel free to, to track me down and uh, we can talk about this stuff. Um, and uh, again, Denim Group is a background. Denim Group is a, uh, a firm that develops a secure software and helps organizations deal with the risks associated with their software. And so a very software-centric view of uh, application security. It's the cloud, right? <laughs> How many, how many people came to this talk because they had cloud in the title? <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll skip this slide. <laughs> um, so sorry, you know, the, 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 the devil made me do it. The devil made me party. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it, so that's a little bit of a joke just because cloud isn't such a buzzword. Um, but uh, it, it, as we'll see, like the way that we've looked at these techniques, um, you know, it, it, like they are, at least the way that we've, we've worked on them, the idea is how can you deal with, how can you automatically start to deal with some of the risk associated if you have private cloud, if you're a service provider and you're providing things, you know, platform as a service, um, you know, certain aspects of software as a service where you have extensions and things like that. Um, any situation that you have where you have infrastructure and you don't have tight controls over what necessarily gets deployed in that infrastructure, um, these, these types of techniques we think could help there. How many folks in your organizations uh, there, there aren't great controls over all of your infrastructure and what gets put out there. You know, you know, a couple folks. <laughs> um, and so, um, and, and so as we'll see, there's there's a couple pieces of this. Uh, there's a couple steps in what we're talking about, and you know, and, and, uh, and, and the steps you can kind of break apart into different pieces and use just portions of it. So, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to look at kind of all the way through from this uncontrolled infrastructure. Um, you know, how do we deal with risk? And and ensure these vulnerability, the vulnerability exposure window that you see. Um, but again, you can, uh, you can kind of chop up and just use the portions of this as well. And you can all take comfort in knowing that I haven't mentioned the advanced persistent threat yet, yet. <laughs> so, in your organization, who's your, who's your worst enemy? Is it your uh, software developers that are building stuff? Or is it the, uh, is it the bad guys that are, that are attacking your stuff? Or, or as Colin says, is it marketing? <laughs> you know, how many people think the developers are your worst enemy? Yeah. How many people think that bad guys actually do the attacking are your worst enemy? Yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, like, I guess an important point to make is uh, the bad guys are ultimately your worst enemy, but in a lot of cases, you know, developers aren't necessarily helping you do what you need to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, but again, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I take a developer centric view of a lot of this stuff and so if you've got to defend the developers um, you know, most developers are happy to write secure code as long as you, uh, you know, teach them how to do it and then uh, like actually give them time to do it uh, most organizations and the way that they uh, you know, management structure and the uh, you know, again, management structure the incentives for development teams and, and all of these things are lined up so that you don't see a strong incentive for developers to build secure code I was, I was giving a talk 
um, about mobile and security stuff at uh, B-Sides Austin. And uh, you know, a question along the way, so, you know, somebody said, like, you just need to beat the crap out of those stupid developers. While I was like, all right, well, that's a security guy that is, like, he's spoken the last word that's ever going to be heard by anyone on his development team, right? Because when he comes around, you're like, oh, you speak the developer, you scroll this stuff up. So like, uh, you know, the Peanuts t-shirt sounds like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that, you know, again, developers are certainly contributing to the problem. Ultimately, you've got to worry about the attackers. And so what we're going to look at here are ways that in the absence, uh, or, or, or as you're putting controls over what gets deployed in your environment, um, you know, what are some things that you can do to help keep certain classes of attackers uh, at bay and to, again, kind of reduce your, uh, your, your, your uh, risk with you? Um, so, you know, the, the problem that you know, we see in a lot of organizations that we work with um, in, in, in a variety of types, types of organizations, but, you know, they have some sort of infrastructure, right? Um, you know, either, you know, it's a, a data center, multiple data centers, uh, maybe they have, uh, you know, a public cloud that they're, uh, you know, that they've got uh, you know, some assets on and people have the ability to, uh, to deploy new assets on. Uh, maybe it's a, you know, a private cloud. But uh, you know, the, the problem is a lot of the organizations that we work with, like, don't have uh, great controls, or at least not consistently enforced controls, over all of the uh, over all of these assets, where tools can expose them to risk, um, and you know as we as we see with the cloud, uh, there are a lot of problems with organizations. Like anybody with a five hundred dollar limit credit card is all of a sudden like their own purchasing department, right? So like all the stuff that you pay, all the controls and stuff that you pay, what to put out there, like, uh, you know, people can like go around and, uh, and, and, and find ways around this stuff, and so what we see are. You know, because the organizations are exposed in a variety of ways, these uh, you know, attackers trolling around with automated, you know, automated traffic. And again, we're not talking um, like I'm not talking here about like very dedicated attackers, right? Like if anonymous decided they really want to beat you up, um, like this is a you know, like a, you, you you probably got other problems. Um, but what we see are these uh, you know, automated SQL injection worms like, trolling around, sending junk traffic uh, at sites and looking for things that have strong signatures, and so they're easy to automate the discovery of things like SQL injection, things like cross-site scripting, other injection type flaws. Um, you see these, these uh, vulnerabilities exposed in applications, they have strong signatures, and so uh, these are the types of things that, uh, again, that the bad guys are gonna be able to find in an automated way, and in a lot of cases, they're gonna be able to exploit them in an automated way, and so you don't have to have uh, you don't have to have someone that's specifically focused in on your organization. Like you're in trouble simply because you have something deployed and because it's uh, exposed out on the internet. Um, and so, again, like to, you know, to what end does this, uh, does this allow attackers to advance whatever goals they have? Again, it depends on the goals. Um, but the, you know, the un unfortunate state of the world is that uh, you know, most you know, public-facing web um, properties are going to be exposed to these types of this type of this type of hostile traffic. And so the proposed solution, or what we've been looking at is, you know, how can we automatically identify newly deployed code? And this, is, uh, this could be either like entirely new applications that have been deployed. Um, you know, somebody spins up a new server, uh, you know, new, new app server, um, you know, provisions, hosting, whatever, and turn something on. Uh, or even deploying new versions of old applications, but uh, you know, putting uh, code out into production. Like, how can you identify in your environment that these types of events have occurred? Because when those changes occur, like that's when you have, uh, you know, that, that's when you have a situation where the security state of the system as it was before is not necessarily the security state of the system that, uh, that there is now. So once you've identified this newly deployed code, then looking to figure out like how can we identify these vulnerabilities that are likely to fall, uh, that are likely to. Uh, identified by this uh, you know, type of hostile traffic and once you've identified those vulnerabilities like you know what your exposure is right so you know hey we've got application like n plus one has been dropped into our environment um, you know we know that we've got some set of vulnerabilities out there and, uh, you know, and, 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 and like how do we like if we know that we've got these vulnerabilities like how do we protect ourselves um, for these specific vulnerabilities that we, where we know we're exposed to risk um, and, and again this is something that, Look, if you look at the data from you know, the Whitehead report, the Veracode report, um, looking like these you know, vulnerabilities, even if even if you know about the application, right, and you've uh, you know, had someone come in and assess the application, you've identified these vulnerabilities. Even in situations like that, organizations are doing a 
really crappy job of closing this window of exposure. Um, a huge problem with in a lot of organizations that we work with is like they don't even know from an inventory standpoint, they don't even know the assets that they have exposed. Um, and so, uh, you know, so how do you protect? Uh, you know, how do you protect when you don't know you even have? It's a, you know, kind of a, an impossible problem. Um, and so. Like there's some other solutions that, that fit in this, uh, you know, that, that, uh, you know, there's other ways to solve these problems which may or may not be um, you know, acceptable or ideal in your environment. Now, this is a, you know, certainly an area where web application firewalls, um, if they're in blocking mode, can provide uh, value. But uh, you know, a lot of organizations don't necessarily have a web application firewall. Um, you know, so you see organizations where the code changes too frequently um, or things are deployed too frequently for the WAP to sufficiently get trained up. Um, you know, we see a lot of environments where the uh, you know, WAF was turned into blocking mode, like for, you know, maybe it got trained for a while, they got turned into blocking mode, and it like, blocked the you know, senior VP of uh, you know, XYZ's uh, like, you know, trying to order flowers for his uh, wife or something like that, and like, you know, all of a sudden WAF is back in, in, in learning mode, right? Like we see way too many, um, you know, we see way too many situations where organizations have deployed a WAF that feel like that is a, uh, you know, like that, that's their great mitigation step, but nobody actually goes and checks to see, hey, is this WAF actually blocking traffic, right? Yeah, or, or, or even is anybody looking at the logs for this stuff? And we, like, we do a lot of um, vulnerability remediation work. And I can think of a specific instance um, that is a, a, a year or two ago where like the, the decision was made, we said, hey, we're gonna fix these vulnerabilities in code. And there's too many vulnerabilities. It doesn't make economic sense to fix these other vulnerabilities. Right, so we're going to rely on the web application firewall technology that's been deployed. Like that is our acceptable remediation. Instead of fixing the code, we're going to rely on the WAF. Uh, ideally, we fix all the code, but honestly, there's too much code to fix in this case. We're going to rely on the WAF to do this. Uh, auditor comes back around on whatever their cycle was, finds the same vulnerabilities that uh, you know, that they were supposed to be fixed. We get the like angry phone call <laughs> saying like, you guys said you fixed this stuff. We said no, like this was uh, supposed to be you know. Handled by the web application firewall, the operations team had to put the uh, web app firewall into blocking mode, and so uh, so the you know, best laid plans of, uh, of mice and men, um, you know, in, in certain environments, you know, either because of uh, you know, inattention or or, or, or intentionally, um, WAFs are not uh, you are just not used in, in this way. Um, and uh, like you know, another option would be to uh, like know when things get deployed, to find vulnerabilities, and then to go and fix the code. Right? Is that like the right way to do things? Right? Because, like you find vulnerabilities, you make changes to the code, you push it live, and then you no longer have vulnerabilities in the code, and you can move on to your next thing. How many organizations are really, really jumping on that real quick? Everybody <laughs> know, like, and, and that's why you see the numbers that we see from the White Hat and, uh, and, and, and Veracode folks, and uh, you know, because you know, folks don't. Uh, you know, identify the vulnerabilities, and when they do identify the vulnerabilities, they don't fix the code. Uh, or, as in another remediation project that we that we worked on, we fixed the code. No one bothered to push it into production. Uh, again, angry phone call. You know, hey, you guys said you fixed this stuff. We said we did. We checked it into the source code repository. We, we, we can't touch your production servers. <laughs> um, and so, uh, like, so again, that would be uh, in, in an ideal world, uh, or in a more ideal world, that may be the option. That so look for is the active scanning programs, uh, assessment programs, and then uh, you know prioritization of fixing these things. But the challenging thing, and Mark Kerfrey mentioned this in his uh, uh, in, in his uh, keynote earlier, is uh, you know like features defeats performance, and performance defeats security, right? And that's like almost across the board for organizations. Like the way that they make decisions, um, you know, there's not a high priority place on making these uh, you know, security fixes. Um, the, Honestly, like really, the way you got to do this is not introduce vulnerabilities in the first place. Uh -huh. Yeah. How many how many organizations have taken that approach? Right. <laughs> there we go. Like that's it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so there are other options, and again, we're we're kind of exploring the use of these techniques and how these can be mixed and matched. And we'll talk about uh, we'll we'll see in the example data that we've got later from the experiments that we've run. Um, you know how uh, how some of that stuff works. And so, uh, you know, there's a couple ways that we've looked at um, identifying newly deployed code. Um, you know, you can uh, like wait around and wait for the application development teams to notify you, like, hey, guess what, we're, you know, we're putting things out of production, right? That, again, ideal world, happy world. Um, you know, we've also played around with scanning the network space. Um, is that something, like, from an asset management standpoint, that's a program that we do see organizations, or some organizations have in place to say, like, okay, hey, like, we have a program to say, like, when do new IPs come online? 
right? When to do uh, you know when to do ports? Uh, like how do we dip those from from day to day? And so that's useful because if you have if you start to have that kind of insight into your environment, you can identify events where you say like, hey, I used to have 100 applications deployed, now I've got 101 applications deployed. Well, uh, yeah, what, what are we going to do? Um, and we've also looked at doing some monitoring of files and directories. And again, depending on how your infrastructure is set up, if you're watching uh, you know, Apache configuration files, if you're watching where you know, new code and stuff gets deployed, you can also identify these events to say, you know, the state of the files and directories have changed, or the state of this config file has changed. Uh, like, let's go and find out what, uh, you know, like what, what new thing or how the state of the system has changed because we might be exposed to new stuff. Um, you know, identifying vulnerabilities. You, know, you could always do manual penetration testing. Um, you know, the problem is that it's really challenging to scale that, um, you know, especially if you don't know, uh, you know, if you don't necessarily know uh, what's deployed in the environment. Um, you know, automated scanning uh, is, is what we're going to look more in detail at, uh, or manual assisted scanning. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, running scans, doing, uh, you know, doing, uh, looking at false positive and things of that nature. Uh, and then finally, blocking traffic. Like, because you're not in a position, or most organizations aren't in a position, or at least the, the window for a fix is not uh, on the nature of like minutes or hours, you know, it's typically measured in days, weeks, and months. Um, what we're going to look at is uh, like, how do you create um, virtual patches to block traffic that may be trying to exploit these uh, identified vulnerabilities? And so you're creating very targeted uh, traffic monitoring rules to look for, uh, you know, to, to identify situations to say, like, this traffic is going to a place where I know I have a vulnerability, that I know I have a vulnerability. Um, I'm going to get very aggressive about blocking that because in a best case scenario, this malicious traffic or this weird looking traffic is going to result in like an error message, right? If you've got like a SQL injection vulnerability and uh, you know, somebody, uh, you know, somebody's last name is O'Hare or something like that. Well, if the code isn't set up to properly handle the apostrophe, you know, if the, in the best case scenario, you're going to get an error that gets picked back. In the worst case scenario, that's an actual like attack traffic that's coming in. And so, um, you know, so, you, know, so you, you, you block it. So. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the overall thing that, we're, that we've used to do this is some technology that we've built called Gridfix. Um, and it does a bunch of uh, consolidation of the vulnerability data from different tools. Um, you know, it integrates with IDS and WAX. And that's specifically what we're going to be looking at. And it also helps to communicate a bunch of stuff out to uh, defect tracking systems. Uh, and this is uh, going to be released open source here shortly. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so we're going to focus you know, specifically on uh, the, the virtual patching stuff. And so, um, like, how do you connect vulnerability scanners to these intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, or web application firewall systems that you've got deployed? Uh, how many folks here in your organizations have web app firewalls deployed? How many folks here have more traditional like network intrusion detection, intrusion prevention stuff deployed? All right, so, so even more. And so that's one of the things that we'll look at is how do we leverage, um, you know, how do we leverage these network intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, and update them so that they can be more relevant against web-based threats. And the, the example we'll use is uh, is is, is Snort. Um, and so what we're going to look at is like based on structured vulnerability data, how do we auto create these rules? And, uh, and what we can also do then is like once we've created those rules, we can monitor the logs and map the alerts where these rules fired, map it back to the uh, you know, map it back to the vulnerabilities that were identified. And so what that can provide, um, you know, what that can provide is insight into not just into where are we vulnerable, but it can provide insight into where are, you know, you know what have attackers discovered or what, what are attackers like what parts of our infrastructure or applications are interesting to folks that are uh, that, that are doing the attacking. Um, because then that can help to prioritize or make a case for um, saying like, hey, can we not, you know, can we not have another feature? Like, can this box not, you know, not have to spin in the next release of the software? Instead, can we like fix the SQL injection vulnerability on the login page? Um, and so, uh, so again, like having data, like where you say, hey, we're exposed to all this stuff, and guess what? These are the ones that are really getting hammered, right? So somebody knows about them. This is uh, valuable. This is uh, scary. Um, you know, based on that data, then you can start to make like an actual, you know, I call them like an adult conversation with management. Right? If you, if you go to management, you say cross-site scripting is scary, right? Neat, right? But uh, you know, but uh, that's not a grown-up conversation, right? If you go to management and say like, hey, you know, attacks on this, these known vulnerabilities have increased 50%, you know, from uh, like this level to this level. Well, all of a sudden, that starts to be a much more convincing argument because it says like, hey, we know that there are people out there with malice that have identified our systems, and they are, you know, this is a, a clear threat. 
and the protections that we have in place aren't necessarily going to last forever. Um, and so, like, you know, we need to allocate resources to fix this. Um, so, specifically, what we put together here is um, the, you know, for, the, for the code change detection, where you know we uh, we've uh, set up a test lab, and I'll talk about that in a, in a second. Uh, we set up a test lab, and basically, when we watch. Um, we watch kind of known directories on this uh, you know, server that we've deployed, so that it can identify, hey, a new, uh, you know, a new application has been dropped on top of Apache, right? You know, the Apache config change and this directory change. Therefore, we have something new. Um, and uh, you know, but this could also be easily wired up again to uh, you know, net network asset tracking systems, uh, you know, diffing nmap scans or something like that. Um, in our environment, just because we don't have like a, you know, million, you know, we don't have like a giant test network, I have like three boxes that's strung together. Uh, at the current time, like uh, to do a you know, exhaustive network scanning and diffing didn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but that's a that's a fairly straightforward problem, I think, to, to at least get us started solving. Um, for vulnerability detection, um, what we do is we kick off automated skip fish, uh, unauthenticated skip fish and W3X scans. Um, and as we'll see, like we can support any dynamic scanning technology. You know, we can like, we can do this with app scan results. We can do it with uh, verb suite results. We can do it with anything that will produce structured vulnerability data for us. Um, the reason that we picked uh, Skipfish and W3F was that uh, those are open source, and so if people want to play around with this and, and replicate the stuff that we did, um, you can do that. You, know, you don't have to, other than having a couple boxes, you don't have to go license something, or it's not, you know, it's not tied to a specific uh, thing. Um, and uh, for blocking traffic, what we've done is we've created rule generation rules, snort and for mod security. And again, uh, the goal here is to use uh, you know, commonly available, freely, you know, common and freely available technologies um, because uh, number one, you know, what you see is uh, you know, if, uh, you know, with snort rules and increasingly with mod security rules, um, like those can be used uh, you know, potentially across different, um, you know, across different blocking technologies. Uh, that's something the mod security folks have done recently. Is they've uh, they've got like a compatibility specification talking about like, hey, if you can support rules like this part of our rule language, like then your WAF can can consume our rules, and uh, you know, and, and that rule language then is something that uh, you know, like, you know, again, you don't have to code rules like for every different blocking technology if the blocking technologies all understand the same rule language, um, and so uh, and the same thing with Snort. You know, Snort is a um, yeah, how many folks have some sort of a snort or a snort variant running in their uh, environment? Um, and so, uh, you know, again, open source technology so folks replicate and rule compatibility. Um, and so, one of the things that we've uh, like that we spent a lot of time on is figuring out, like, for all these different detection technologies, right? Uh, you know, all these different scanning technologies, what are kind of the fundamental? What's the fundamental data that it's providing that gives you insight into the vulnerabilities you've got in your code? Um, and so here we see Skipfish data, uh, which is a, a JSON. Uh, you know, folks look at this, and uh, you know, it's got a severity four type is this, you know, map stack. Uh, you know, we, we map everything back to the MITRE CWE um, because that works across. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a little bit more granular than like the OWASP top ten and the OWASP you know, twenty six or OWASP forty two or whatever OWASP we have these days. Um, and uh, you know, so that lets us normalize all this data back. Um, you know, and we see we've got a URL here where the problem is. And we see that uh, you know, what are, you know, injection points and things like that. You know, if we move over here to W3AF, uh, it's got XML file, file results. Um, you know, and we see uh, I mean, post uh, the type here is the OS command vulnerability. Uh, you see the URL and you see the injection point there. And also just to look at like IBM uh, rational app scan vulnerability data, um, and we've got the issue type here is a line SQL injection. Um, it's got a link to uh, some remediation content. Um, and then you can see uh, here's the URL uh, and whatnot. And so um, one of the things that we did is um, normalize a bunch of these different product, products. And like this is something we've been working on, like some of this data manipulation for the last couple of years. And what we found is like the initial kind of constructs we created have actually been like really durable over time. And uh, and, what, and what we look at are like two different things. Like for this dynamic uh, assessment data, um, you know, if you have a tuple of the vulnerability type combined with the vulnerable URL and the injection point, like that is typically stuff that you can get out of any of the file formats for the major stuff that we've looked at out there, right? And so that lets you know, I have a SQL injection vulnerability, it's in login.jsp, and the injection point is the parameter of username, right? And so like for injection type vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, things like that, like that helps you uniquely identify, um, you know, at least for our purposes, uniquely identify a specific vulnerability. Uh, also, for other types of vulnerabilities, and this depends on, again, on the CWE vulnerability type, 
Um, you know, it's sufficient to say, well, I've got a vulnerability type and I've got the vulnerability URL, right? I have a predictable uh, resource location, right? I have login.php.back, right? So if I know that I've got a predictable resource location and I know the location of that resource, you don't have, like, for, a, for, for the vulnerability to be exploited, you don't have to, like, you know, there's not an injection point that comes in at, like, a specific place. You just need to know, like, hey, this resource is here and it shouldn't be. Same thing with things like directory indirect indexing and stuff like that. Um, and so one of the things we found is for, like, all the providers that we've looked at, with one exception, we're, we're, we're talking to them about this, but, like, this is kind of the core information that you need to know about a vulnerability so that you can start manipulating this stuff and doing interesting things. Right, because it lets you do stuff like deduplicate results. Right, if I have, you know, if I've got Skipfish results and W3F results, and I know for both of those that you know, Skipfish calls something blind SQL injection, W3F calls it uh, you know, blind you know, SQL injection or capitalization zipper or something like that, but we map both of those back to the CWE. You know, the same thing. If we know that the URL is a specific uh, thing and the injection point is a you know, parameter, uh, username, or parameter, or password, like, that lets us say, you know, this, these two tools found the same vulnerability. And so if this found if this one found 10 and this one found 10, that doesn't mean I have 20 vulnerabilities. Maybe that means I've only got 15 vulnerabilities, right? And so uh, so that's one of the things that we, we spent a lot of time doing is that dedupli uh, deduplication process. Uh, because that lets you, uh, especially looking at uh, you know, using multiple technologies like this, you know, different crawlers have different strengths. Um, and there was a really good blog post, like somebody spent a tremendous amount of time. Has anybody seen this recently, the comparison all of the dynamic scanners? Uh, yeah, I mean that, that person spent a uh, in, in incredible amount of time, um, you know, going going through all that stuff. <laughs> um, uh, wow! And, and, and so, like, hopefully, with the technology we built, that will make this type of stuff, like that type of analysis, easier to do in the future. To say, hey, I've got these twenty different scanners. We're going to pull the data, and we've got an engine that'll actually you know, normalize that stuff. Um, you know, so what else do we need? Now, one thing that I would like to see that we don't have a great way of getting consistently now is better information about the payload. Because right now, we're fairly aggressive with the payloads that we're creating again, because we know we have a vulnerability. But in certain situations, like with SQL injection, was the payload um, you know, able to, you know, was, that, was it a problem because we had an apostrophe in there or because we had a double quote in there or because we had something else in there? Um, and so uh, right now, the signatures that we're generating could be slightly aggressive. Um, so that, that would be great. And that's something that, like, you see things like uh, you know, AppScan has, like, different variants. They say, well, here's the vulnerability, here's a bunch of variants. And so some of the polls have that data, um, other scanners don't. Um, so, uh, see. Uh, so if we look at the, you know, and, and again, like, once you've got the structured data, then you just need a language to express what traffic looks like, and then you can start creating this stuff. So here's an example snort rule where we're saying, like, drop packets from here to wherever. Um, you know, Snort has some constructs, uh, and not as powerful as like mod security, but Snort does have some constructs that let you like break down to like slice out pieces of HTTP traffic and, uh, and and target certain things, and then you know basically we've got regular expressions to say this is what I think a SQL injection attack might look like. Um, yeah, here's an example of mod security patch again, different rule language, but given the the, the the data we have about the vulnerabilities, once that's structured stuff, it's just running a really simple transform. Um, and we've got two different approaches that we've talked about um, you know, for, for these virtual patches. Either saying, here's the vulnerability type and here's the vulnerability location, right? Hey, there's a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability in this, uh, in this parameter on login.php. Or you can say, here's what traffic looks like that's scary, and here's the location that I don't want to see this traffic going to. You know, watch out for HTML-ish characters that are being sent to login.php and whatnot. Uh, the approach that we've got right now for, these, uh, for the store and the mod security stuff, um, follow the second approach. Right, because they don't, in, you know, in, in, interior, they don't necessarily have a, an idea of this is what a SQL injection attack looks like. When we've talked to some of the commercial vendors that we're looking to support, they prefer the first approach, right? Like, hey, we've got our magic where we know what we, 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 know what we think a SQL injection uh, vulnerability looks like. Um, and so just tell us where it is, and we'll augment our training with that, uh, with, with, with that information. Um, <laughs> And so the standard that we use when creating this stuff is uh, basically like if the scanner shuts up, we assume the vulnerability is fixed, right? And that's not true. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, you know, but, but, uh, but basically the process we went through is like, let's tweak the detection payloads until we've got the case for all the scanners, but we've got to be careful for overly aggressive stuff. And again, I know what everybody's gonna say is like, eh, it doesn't mean it's actually fixed. That won't stop the advanced persistent thread. 
You're right. Um, <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, that's not necessarily what we're trying to do here because what we're looking at is for things, right, for right now at least we're looking for things to be discovered in an automated way. How do we make it so that those things won't be discovered in an automated way and won't become a target for, uh, for, for, for attack? Uh, test environment is real straightforward. It's got the, you know, a scanner and a rule generator that talks across a box that's got the you know, two NICs in it and uh, you run the scan against the, against the web app. And so the process we do, we run through is you know, detect when something changes, that alerts the scanner, it runs the scan, generates rules, puts those on the, uh, you know, puts those on the sensor, helps the sensor so it reloads the rules, and, uh, you know, and then reruns the scan. And, uh, and because of this different technology, or, or, now, and this different, these different routines that we've written, um, you, can, you can look and see, well, yay, when we first did the scan, there were this many vulnerabilities, as far as the scan knows. The second time we did the scan, there was only this many vulnerabilities. Um, so I'll just do a quick, Demo. And so, this is what the. Should we do? Should we log in. Um, you can pick the way that you want to handle the traffic, right? So, uh, like for the blocking stuff, you may want to turn it into blocking mode, you may just want to turn it into alert mode. Demo video is not working for me, which is great. Hmm. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's running this Okay. Um, and so what this does here is uh, like basically we've got a script. So we can script this all via web services. So we can make a call in and say, create a new, you know, detect a new application, create it in the system, um, attach it to this type of uh, sensor that we know it's behind. Uh, I'm going to run a scan. Uh, toss the, uh, you know, once I get the results of the scan, toss that back into the, uh, into the uh, sensor, pop the sensor so it reloads the rules. Uh, those are the rules that got generated there, and then it reruns the scan after that to confirm or deny that the fixes actually uh, actually worked. Um, and I'll, I can, if someone wants to see afterward, I can show you a like, better fidelity demo of this stuff. Um, so we've got results for Snort and Mod Security. What we saw with Snort, um, Basically, uh, you know, we started out finding uh, 20 things from Skipfish, 10 things to the 3F, or the 3 Dreams, and they found different stuff. Um, you know, after we ran, you know, once we generated rules for thread fix, we actually shrank the number of things from 20 to 10. Like, all vulnerability types can't be remediated this way. This lends itself to injection type things, process scripting, things that have that strong type of signature, which also, thankfully, tends to have a strong type of signature for protection. Um, an interesting thing here is, uh, like, with uh, like W3F, doesn't like it when Snort is dropping packets in between there. Like it, uh, it, it actually like the, the scans don't. Really, and that's a, I think I don't think I've about any practice. And, uh, for, and for mod security, what we uh, you know, we did a uh, similar stuff here, um, where uh, where we were in the W three F, and what we did is we looked at this in two different ways. We looked at mod security just as a blocking technology, but we also baselined it against the mod security core rule set. Um, because you know, like virtual caching is neat and all, but if you know, but if, if you can just like throw the core rule, core rule set in front of something, okay, well, like why, you know, why do we put it all in trouble? Another interesting thing is that uh, is that the uh, uh, skipfish, with with the core rule set inside of there, actually detects additional false positives when it's run against uh, against a sensor that's running the core rule set, um, and so there's actually more vulnerabilities that get identified. <coughs> um, in certain cases, you know, for mod security with the, with the core rule set. And again, as you see here, we're able to go from a vulnerability exposure like this to just like that with ThreadFix, uh, you know, which is you know, slightly better here for the technology that's not. Um, you know, we're able to block some injection technology. Uh, we're, we're able to block some injection techniques that uh, W3F, uh, current, the core rule set currently doesn't do out of the box, and we're actually working with the Ryan and those guys to see. Um, you know, they did a really cool thing, uh, which I've got a link to, I think, here. Yeah. They did a really cool thing um, with their SQL injection challenge. Anybody participate in that or, or follow along with that? Like, really cool stuff to look at. Like, how can how attackers try and bypass these different rules? Um, and so, the, you know, the IDS, the uh, interesting thing we found, IDS IPS WAF has an impact on the scanning process, um, in which is cool. Snort breaks W3F, mod security CRS introduces false positives. Um, you know, overall, the mod, the mod security CRS is really good. Um, or is, is, is pretty good, and uh, you know, and, and so you know that may be an option for folks. Uh, you know, again, if you're you know, like there may be concerns about false blocks and things like that. Um, and uh, where we had the biggest win, is, you know, so far is using virtual patching to address these uh, the, the injection type flaws, where it's maybe too scary 
to block this traffic in general, um, but more acceptable to do, again, if you know that you've got a specific vulnerability in place. Um, so immediately, out of the box, this is uh, interesting for environments where you have little or no control over the deployed code. Um, you know, so X, Y, Z is a service, um, <laughs> or all data centers. Um, you know, or, or, uh, or environments where you have a large application security debt, right? Where you're coming and trying to start a program and saying, you know what, you know, hey, we scan, you know, we just scanned our 500 websites, and uh, we've got like all kinds of problems, and uh, you know, uh, you know, like how are we gonna, how are we gonna like shrink our exposure um, in a in, in a very rapid, uh, you know, very, very short amount of time. Um, you know, the current problems. Uh, if you look at uh, the data vulnerability data formats, don't like kind of require us to have somewhat coarse grain virtual patches. And when I, when I talk about coarse grain, I'm talking about coarse grain from the standpoint of the reg X's of the traffic that you try to block. Um, you know, because you have to, because there are a variety of different variants of like how SQL injection or cross site scripting or something like that might be uh, executed, and you've kind of got to block all of them to shut the scanner up. Um, but that may be blocking too much because of the particular of the, the particulars of the code that uh, this is being run against. Um, and uh, you know, problems with this, you know, like uh, uh, virtual patches likely will not stop well-informed, determined attackers. But a hope here is that against uh, you know, unfocused attackers, they're not going to be well-informed because they wouldn't have discovered these vulnerabilities in the first place, right? Like those, those you know, the, the window would have been closed on those. And again, I, I really recommend everybody look at the mod security SQL injection challenge. They got some really good data out of that on like the time it takes to, to, uh, you know, to discover these uh, types of bypasses. Uh, you know, next steps, more data. You know, we want to, you know, this is currently being run against uh, you know, a set of target applications in our environment that are intentionally flawed. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're looking to expand at that. Um, we want to develop import support for more scanner technologies. Um, and that's pretty easy. We've got it down where a basic import can typically be written in like an hour or so if you're running against XML or something like that. Um, you know, it takes more time to you know, make sure you're covering all the CWEs and stuff like that, but uh, you, you can get some, some really good results pretty quickly. Um, you want to create uh, virtual patch signatures for more vulnerability classes. Um, the, the, uh, the, the core rule set guys from Mod Security have some interesting stuff for like CSERF protection that works in the newer versions. Uh, we may look at borrowing um, some of the stuff that they're doing there again to provide you know, these targeted solutions. Um, but, and there's limitations on what can be done. You're not going to be able to block like authorization type vulnerabilities, but those are also the types of things that just get W3F or, or other things that are like, especially in an unauthenticated scan, aren't likely to identify. Um, and the nice thing, you know, like we've seen point solutions for this before. The really, or like a, a, a cool thing I think about what we've put together is that in, 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 instead of having like a, a hub and, uh, or this creates like a hub and spoke way of creating virtual patches where you know, to support, you don't have to create each integration that you may want. You just have to create the, uh, you, you just have to say, hey, if I've got a new import technology that I want to use, then I just have to write that. If I have a new blocking technology I want to support, then I just uh, you know, have to have to build the stuff for that. Um, and all of this data is being brought in and normalized, which in this case is handy for virtual patching. And I think also for organizations that have like heterogeneous, um, like scanning uh, technologies that are being used or multiple scanning technologies that are being used, it's, it's helpful for that as well. Um, and if you're interested in uh, participating in the beta for this, uh, let me know. Just uh, send, send me an email. Uh, if this is something that you're looking at for your, that might be interesting in your environment. Um, again, we're uh, we're excited to have this technology finally pushed out, and uh, would love to. I'd love to have you complaining at us about how it, what it needs to do to work better. Thank you all.